So the exhibition, uh, Cabezas, uh, focuses on the work of Rafael Soriano. It has 21 pieces going from the late 60s uh, towards the very end of his working life. He basically stopped painting in the year 2000 because of health reasons and also uh, his failing memory. Uh, and what's interesting is that the work, it, it's not a series per se, but it is an obsession that over the years you see how he goes back to a way of depicting the figure specifically focused on the head and the face. And of course, we can associate that with traditional notions within European culture and Western Hemispheric culture, the face as a mirror of the soul uh, and as basically the vessel uh, of human life, right? where we see how people think, how they feel, etc. So that's a, a constant thing throughout all of these 21 pictures. Uh, uh, he was born in the small town of Sidra in Matanzas. His family then moved to the city of Matanzas proper. Uh, and for an artist of his generation, he was born in 1920. His father was a barber and his mom was a homemaker, were very uh, encouraging of his vocation, which I'm sure you understand that that's actually exceptional. Uh, and so he received private lessons uh, with a local artist by the name of Tanasco. Uh, and then eventually he was part of a generation that received scholarships and attended the San Alejandro Academy of Fine Arts in Havana. Uh, so, it's important for this particular generation, these artists born in the 1920s uh, into the early 30s, because they are in effect the last generation that were trained by the major artists who trained basically three generations of modern artists in Cuba. So they were taught by a painter by the name of Leopoldo Romagna, uh, and they were also taught by a sculptor by the name of Juan José uh, whose work is also in the collection of this museum. So Soriano received a very thorough academic training. Uh, the early work that he does right after his graduation shows a lot of the concerns of artists of, of that generation, of that period. You see some elements of surrealism, etc. cetera. Uh, he then did something which was very unique for that generation of artists, and it's important to understand, since we are in the Organization of American States, and what those responsibilities imply, is that this happens in his life when Cuba has is only constitutional form of government, okay? He was a constitutional democracy with problems, of course, but a constitutional democracy from 1940 until March of 1952. So these are the years when an artist like Soriano and his generation come of age. After the graduation, he decided he was going to hacer patria, which is a phrase that Jorge Mañana, the Cuban philosopher, used a great deal. And that meant going back home to Matanzas and being a, a group of artists, being part of a group of artists who founded their provincial school of fine arts. And so there he would spend the rest of his life as a teacher, uh, teaching the foundation classes, as well as also serving as the director, the principal of the school uh, throughout many years. In the 1950s, he was a leading artist working in the concrete geometric manner. Uh, he was part of a group of artists called Los Diez Pintores Concretos, uh, and they exhibited throughout the island. Uh, I won't say any more about that because the leading scholar of that material is in the room. I hear Kali Kavi McEwen, and I always feel I'm going to mess it up at some level. Uh, but what is fascinating is that he's part of a generation that supported wholeheartedly the change of governance in Cuba. None of those artists of that generation were supporter, supporters of the Batista coup of March 1952. So they received the revolution with enthusiasm in 1959, and basically between 59 and 62, you see a process of dissolution taking place. Uh, and in the case of Soriano, of course, he found himself in exile by 1962. Uh, and of course, uh, what a, a, a well-known Cuban writer, Jesus Diaz, has defined as that boring and wealthy suburb of Havana known as Miami. And so he settled in Miami with the majority of Cubans. Uh, there he earned his living uh, as a graphic designer, uh, for Mecánica Popular, uh, the Spanish language version of popular mechanics. Uh, he also taught uh, in the local college. And most significantly, after a few traumatic years when he couldn't paint, he eventually started to paint again. And so you start to see the work emerging out of the background of concrete uh, geometric paintings. Uh, and so the earliest example that we have in the exhibition is the painting at the top of the stairs, uh, which is the Cabeza de una reina mística, the head of a mystical queen. And there you can see some remnants of cubism, not just in the fascinating of forms, but the use of the palette. Okay? 
Africa, which is very much a monochromatic palette. In this room, you also have another interesting transitional work, uh, which is the, the Collar Magico. And there you can see, again, an interesting fusion with some elements of geometric abstraction, a kind of variation of a, of a color wheel, and then this funky, almost metallic looking construction of a head, which has obviously some connections with surrealism. Uh, the other key element uh, in this gallery are the two paintings to the side of that. And of course, I think you will notice right away that they have obviously religious or spiritual subject matter. Uh, you can see obviously the one that is an image of the Virgin with the halo in the back and the seer figure over on the left. I want you to pay attention at something that will be recurring throughout the paintings, and it has to do with his technique of painting. Soriano would paint in a way very similar to the 17th century Spanish Baroque painters like Velázquez or Zurbarán. He would start with a very dark ground, and then from dark he would move towards light uh, by modeling with lighter colors, and then superimposing on top of that glazes of different colors that would then create the push and pull between the background and the foreground of the shapes. So as you look around this room, you can see these figures emerging in profiles, partly upper torsos, the tops of heads. And what I think is a constant theme is this emanation of light, right? Almost as if this light is coming from the inside of the forms towards the surface. Okay. Now, I'm old enough that I actually met Soriano when I was 19 and 20. And one of the things that I found fascinating about him is that uh, he was a very intuitive artist. He didn't like to talk much. Uh, so when you ask him questions the way you know, a typical 19 or 20 year old will be asking questions, he would just say, well, you know, it happens. I'm, I'm painting and these things happen. It evolves in, in the process of creating. Uh, and I think that's also part of, of what we might call the alchemy or the mystery of his creative process as an intuitive artist. Having said that though, this is an artist who from the very beginning of his life had an interest in spirituality and mysticism. Okay? Uh, he was very much interested in theosophy. Uh, I was actually told a few months ago by a curator from Cuba that a portrait of a founder of the Theosophy Society of Havana uh, is in the headquarters of that building, which I have no idea they still have, a uh, Theosophy Society in Havana, and the portrait was made by Soriano. He was also very much involved with the Rosicrucians uh, when he was a young man and their techniques for meditation. So I think you also see another interesting strain throughout the history of modern art in general, right? That artists in the 20th century, uh, and I would even argue artists after World War II, after the devastation of the war, the atomic bomb, the concentration camps, this need to look for some aspect of transcendence uh, through their art. Uh, that goes just beyond the scientific or the purely material. Okay? And so that is something that's very much a part of Soriano's work. Okay? So if we can go on to the next gallery. Did much like you miss so much in them. Uh, and so the fact that you can see 
the depth of the dark backgrounds is significant, and that you can see all the different layers of the forms pushing and pulling on the surface of the canvas, attest to the wonderful lighting that they have done. So if you look quickly around the room, you will see different variations of what can be a human head, from this rather sci-fi looking sort of helmet, to the profile, again, this is very mystical figure of a woman back there, the more skull-like pieces in the background. It is interesting that this palette has this wonderful range between blues and purples and pinks, and then the shift to these bronze color, ochre, rust colors. But it is a constant, the use of blue. And many scholars that deal with artists who come from Matanzas uh, bring this uh, as a point of discussion. Uh, Soriano would always talk about how the Bay Matanzas would change colors seven times a day. So you would have seven variations of blue from the morning until the evening. Uh, and it is interesting that the founder of this museum, Jose Gomez-Sicre, who was also from Matanzas, and a good friend of Soriano since they were young, would always say that. Uh, for example, I'm from Havana, so he would always say about Havana. You guys don't have La Bahia de Matanza, so which changes color seven times a day. You have no idea what true aesthetic experience is unless you have seen that bay change color seven times a day. You can see that reflected uh, in a very poetic manner in the way that Soriano works with the blues. And then I think part of the wonder of these pictures is the open-ended quality of them. Right? They, they are not literal. Uh, they are open enough that we can get lost in terms of our own, our own reverie when we look at them, and things are suggested in the pictures. Like, for example, uh, when we had this painting up at my university, a lot of the students will come up and uh, we have a, a group of, of uh, a fabulous association and they were saying that this was like a priestess. I, of course, made a mistake and said, oh, well, like a nun, no, 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 like a nun, like a priestess. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm an old guy, so I still make those mistakes on a regular basis, as my 29-year-old daughter reminds me. But I do want you to pay attention to the shape of the hat and how it becomes a kind of habit. So it is priestly-like, right? And again, the way the face sort of disappears into the shadows. But look at the subtle changes of color. And this is the one thing that I sound like a broken record when I say he was a painter's painter. And you have this incredible richness and variation on the surface. You will see this also in the work of contemporaries that were kindred spirits when we get to the last uh, gallery uh, on the sport, and these are works from the permanent collection. And then two of my favorite paintings in the exhibition are these two, Cabeza Echizala, the witch head, and the homenaje a Nicolás de Cusa. The witch head, uh, it's, it's really an image of great anxiety. Right? It's, it's very disturbing, you have this scarf-like shape, uh, the head is pulling back, there is a sense of struggle. Uh, so the question always is, well, you know, what is going on? Is this a, a, a political painting or is this a painting about a, a much deeper existential kind of quest about meaning, right? I think we can read it either way. But again, look at the way he plays with the blues and then the subtle transition into the yellow ochres and the yellows, the pinks and the oranges. And then the head of uh, Nicolás de Cusa, um, according to uh, Milagro Soriano, the artist's widow, he was very aware of the figure of Nicolás de Cusa from his days uh, and his interest in the Rosicrucians. And again, this is an incredibly obscure yet important figure uh, from the Middle Ages. He was a theologian, a philosopher, an astronomer, uh, someone who simultaneously was a cardinal of the Catholic Church and yet under suspicions of heresy right up until his death. So this very fascinating paradoxical figure that is seen as a precursor for what will be the humanism of the Renaissance period, okay, from you know the very end of the Middle Ages. To me, what's fascinating is how he evokes that with paint, right, in, in a non-literal manner. Uh, even though he's not dressed like a clergyman, again, in a literal way, he evokes the robes of a prince of the church. Uh, but the most fascinating thing is the sort of shifting and turning of forms that the brushwork does right on the surface of the face, right? Because although we can see the eye, the nose, and part of the mouth, I think we can very much read this 
shifting of shapes as a visual representation of the inner workings of this man's mind or soul. Right? This, this very uh, sort of uh, intellectually deep and spiritually adventurous type of personality. And yet the colors are, again, evoking very much the sense of mystery, beautiful, deep, dark colors in the background, and then again, an amazing variation of purples and pinks and yellows. So what I do hope that you will all be able to do while the exhibition is up is come back and spend time quietly in front of the paintings, because these are paintings that, like the works we will see in the final gallery uh, of artists like Cecil or Morales, uh, are meant to be meditative experiences. You're not supposed to just see them uh, quickly, right? You start by looking at them, and then over time, you start to actually see the paintings. Okay. So let's make our way to the final gallery. On the way out, I want you to, to look at the portrait of the prisoner, uh, which will be right by the door. You may not all fit inside. That's true, right? So you may want to from Argentina right here in the entrance. And these are artists who are really kindred spirits for Soriano. Uh, it's work that is both abstract and it has figure developments. It uses surrealistic and abstract elements. And they both have a kind of like a physical exploration quality. At the other end of the wall, you will also find more by artists who are contagious of Soriano. Independent artists from the Academy, and then also the work of Roberto Diablo and Roberto Sovina, who attended the San Alejandro Academy with Soriano, and they were classmates of his. And then, of course, the fact that, that the artists on the back wall weren't compatriots of Soriano. In conclusion, I would say that you should see his work as part of the larger visual adventure of the Western Hemisphere particularly artists born in the decade of the 1920s, that as they came of age in the late 40s, 50s, and so forth, went beyond traditional ways of doing abstraction and favored much more metaphysical and spiritual explorations of subject matter. And again, please come back, see the exhibition uh, while it's up, and spend some time in front of the paintings. And of course, you know, a plug for the museum, support the AMA uh, as much as you can. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, this has been an incredible opportunity for us not only to have Hortensia, but to have Alejandro here together to present this to you.